enjoy the confession of sins. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all
portion of God's Word that we want to consider this evening comes to us from Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, which is a couple verses. Where Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you all as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. <clears throat> if we are going to understand these words, then we need to get a handle on this whole concept of, of sifting. Now I'm guessing that some of you here probably have a better idea of how to harvest a crop more than I do, being a city person myself. But um, so all of the all the details of how exactly they might have done this back in those days, um, we, we don't have all of those details. But we're talking about a process of, of getting the kernel of wheat out of the head of that wheat stalk. So it's a matter of, first of all, you've got to cut it out of the field, and, and they didn't have the big combines like we have today that just do it all for you. Um, they needed to do it by hand. So once they had, had cut that stalk out of the field, yeah, it was a matter of how do you get the grain away from the stalk? Because it's the grain that, that is the edible part. That's the part you want. All that other stuff called the chaff, we need to break that apart. And again, all the different steps that they perhaps had taken, we're not told about. But in, in the Bible, there's at least two aspects of that process of threshing the wheat that we could perhaps, that we are a little familiar with. One of them is called winnowing. Right? That, that concept, that illustration is used a few times in the Bible, typically in connection with judgment. And winnowing was was usually the last part of the process. Most of the chaff had been broken away, and so the, the, the kernel was there, but there were still some very lightweight pieces of sheathing or whatever you want to call it that were still around the grain. And so to get that off, it's typically just a matter of tossing it in the air and letting the wind blow that chaff away. And I, I have to imagine that if you got really good at that, I mean, let's say you have a basket of, of wheat kernels, and you're just tossing them up in the air, it would almost be poetic. You know, there's almost a rhythm to it, and you're tossing it up, and the wind blows the chaff away, and the wheat would come back down, and almost be mesmerizing, I would, I would envision, to, to watch that. But here, we're talking about sifting was probably not as poetic to watch because sifting would have been earlier in the process and it would have been a little more violent. It would have been um, the, the act of, of really shaking and, and, and agitating the, the stalk of that wheat to break it apart. I envision maybe they would take the stalks and even pound them on the ground that they would just kind of break them apart. Or maybe they would, they would put them in a, in a sifter of some kind where it would, it would kind of break the, the outside pieces of that chaff off, but the grains of kernel would fall through, the kernels of grain would, would fall through the, that, that filter of whatever kind that they might have had. And so what is the point of this? Why does... Jesus used that concept of sifting like wheat, that, that agitation of getting the, the wheat away from the chaff. Well, he's using it as a picture of those times in our lives when we have to face serious temptation, when we have to, our, our faith is being challenged, and we are being shaken to our very core to, to, to shake off all of the, the chaff all the, that, that might be hindering our faith life so that we get down to to what are we really holding on to? And that's exactly what Jesus is warning of here when he talks to Peter, he talks to all of us, and he says, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. In other words, there's, there's temptation coming, there's, a, there's some pretty big challenges coming in your life, and are you ready for them? So with that simple understanding of, of what we're talking about, we say sifting like wheat, now we, let's dig into these words and understand what Jesus is saying. The first thing that strikes us is that Jesus calls Peter by name twice. He repeats his name. 
Now, this isn't the first time that, or the only time in the Bible that Jesus does that. Anytime Jesus repeats a name or repeats something, the point is, pay attention. Because what he's about to say is something quite important. We might be familiar with the, the, the phrase, um, truly, truly, or from the King James, verily, verily, I say to you, Jesus would say. Or the, the word, fourth word from the cross, Aloy, Aloy, Jesus cried out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? He did the same thing with names. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He pleaded for them. Martha, Martha, why are you so worked up about things? And here we see it again. <coughs> Simon, Simon, Satan wants to sift you this wheat. Clearly, there is something important that he wants all of us to sit up and take notice of. And the next two phrases certainly live up to that. First of all, just that phrase, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. It almost sounds like the devil is coming to Jesus and asking permission to, to do this. Well, I hope that's what it sounds like, because that's exactly what it means. And this is the first time that we've heard of a, of a situation similar to this. Remember in the story of Job, that the Lord himself asked Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And it just brings to mind a couple truths about this this relationship that the devil has with God. First of all, we, we realize, if we're talking about a time of, of temptation, <coughs> never does that come from our God. James tells us that point blank, that, that surely our God tempts no one. But yet our, our Lord allows the devil, allows our sinful flesh, allows the world around us, allows those enemies to bring temptation into our lives. Yet the comforting thing that we also discover there is by the fact that Satan has this desire to do this, that he can't do it until the Lord gives permission. In other words, the Lord's in charge. The Lord has complete power over the devil. And the devil cannot do anything without the Lord's permission. And how wonderful it is to know then that our God controls him like a dog on a leash. Right? The gospel contains the devil, that he can only go so far and the Lord will only allow him to go so far. So, for that first phrase then, Satan's asked to sift you as wheat. We, we pick up on that relationship there. Now, the next phrase, if you didn't know what was coming, you know who speak these words, Jesus, you have a pretty good idea of who he is. How do you think he would continue that statement? Peter, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. But what? But don't worry, Peter. I've, I've got this covered. Think that's what he might say? Ah, uh, but don't be afraid, Peter. I, I won't let it happen. It's not at all what it says. It goes on and says, But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. He said yes. Jesus gave permission to Satan to sift Simon as wheat. And he basically says, I hope you do okay. I hope you make it through. I'll pray for you, Simon. Shocking to hear our Savior speak those words. That he would actually let this temptation come and to, to rattle him to his very core. That he would let it go, but, and yet saying, but I'm going to pray for you. I, I pray that you do well. I pray that you make it through. I pray that you stand firm in your faith and you don't lose your faith altogether. And that's exactly what he says. And it, it, it forces us, again, to, to just consider how our God functions in this life. In fact, it, it finally leads us to ask the question, why? Like, why, why would God do this? Why would the Lord allow a time of trial like this. And in extreme, understand that we're talking about the, what we heard about in our Passion reading, how Peter denied Jesus. That was the temptation that was coming. Tempted to deny him three times, and he fell victim to it every single time. Why? How could he do that? We realize that our God can use times of temptation to break us down, to humble us, to force us to ask, in whom are you putting your trust? Or to even use Peter's words, 
later in life, inspired by the Holy Spirit to say this, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Times of testing. An opportunity for us to, to cling to our Savior. To break off that chaff that, that might be hindering our faith life. And again, we certainly see an example of that in Peter. Because that's exactly what he needed. And we pick up on it a little bit. See if you can figure out who exactly Peter is putting his confidence in. I mean, in the verse shortly right after our text here in Luke's Gospel, he says this, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Matthew records in the same conversation sometime that evening that Peter said this, Even if all fall away out of kind of you, I never will. Oh, Peter. So bold. So confident. But in what? Himself, isn't it? That's who he's confident. He's confident in his own ability. No problem. I certainly have a faith stronger than these other disciples. You can bring on whatever, Jesus. I will take it. Can you imagine how he felt then as that rooster crowed and Jesus looked at him? He was sifted as wheat, forced to acknowledge what he was trusting in and that it did not work. Trusting in himself, he failed. He failed miserably. And that's why the Lord uses sometimes those times of sifting to wake us up to that same thing. And ask yourself, how are you doing with temptation in your life? You know what your pet sins are. You know what those, those temptations that always tend to, to get you. Who, who are you trusting in? How, how are you doing as you face those challenges? Did you put yourself in those situations time and time again think, oh, this time will be different. This time I will win. I will not give in. Are we confident in ourselves only to fail miserably once again? Do we, we find ourselves overwhelmed by, by whatever challenge it is, whatever addiction we might be wrestling with, and say, why can't I break out of this? Because we're still looking to ourselves to try to fix it. God allows temptation sometimes to come to sift us as we, to humble us, to break us down, to get us to that point where we realize we can't fix this. We need something else. We need something from outside of us to fix this. In fact, we need someone from outside of us to fix this. And that someone, of course, is Jesus. And that's what Jesus goes on to highlight. In the, in the last verse of our text here, he says this. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. It's as if Jesus could look ahead, see that Peter was going to fail miserably. He was going to pray for him that he wouldn't lose his faith altogether. But he realizes, he sees that, no, he's not going to. He's going to turn back. Reference to repentance. And he's going to recognize his sins. And he's, he's going to repent of those sins. And he's going to cling to Jesus. Now, how? Besides being true God. How did Jesus know that? How could Jesus be so confident that Peter would turn back? That he was still going to then task him with this work of strengthening his brothers? Because Jesus was the one who would make it happen. Jesus was sifted as wheat. Think about his entire life. He started right after his baptism. 40 days in the wilderness going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil himself. Oh, the devil knew how to put the screws to Jesus. Tempting him. 40 days he hadn't eaten anything. Take these stones bread. Simple enough. The power that, that, that Satan tried to wield Jesus kept coming back to him with passages of Scripture. Oh, Satan's no fool. He picks up on that. He uses Scripture. Doesn't the Bible say that the angels will save you? Just jump. And yet he conquered every single one of them. Jesus was sifted as we Think of the, the challenges that he dealt with throughout his entire ministry. Whether it was coming from his fellow Jews, from Gentiles, from the religious leaders. They didn't listen to him. They denied what he was saying. 
constant persecution, constant temptation to just stop the fight and give in to whatever they were, were selling. They did. And then, of course, willing to go through that kangaroo court, be willing to be brutalized, nailed to a cross. All for you and for me. Jesus was sent as his weak. He accomplished our salvation. He accomplished our forgiveness through all of that work. So that when we face those times of temptation, he breaks us down, he breaks us apart and says, stop trusting in yourself, cling to me. He's got the power to do it. He, he is the solution. He is the forgiveness that we desperately need. And so that's exactly what he says. Now he has equipped us. Now that, that he has broken us down, he has sifted us as wheat, now we're, we're recognizing that he has accomplished our salvation, so we're clinging to him. Now he says, once you have repented, turn back, he says, now strengthen your brothers and sisters. Well, Peter certainly did that, didn't he? And do you remember how he was reinstated? Do you remember the, the great miracle of, of the catch of fish after Jesus had risen from the dead and they had breakfast together and he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And he reinstated him. He had turned back. And now he says, feed my sheep. He had work to do. You remember his powerful sermon on Pentecost? 3,000 people came to know Jesus on that day. The Lord working through Peter. How he reached out to Jew and Gentile alike. Inspired to write two letters that we still use today that, that strengthen us and guide us in our lives. He did exactly what Jesus encouraged him to do. So what about you? Now you've been sifted as wheat. Recognize that, that sometimes the Lord uses those times of trial in you to, to break away the pride, break away all that chaff so you can focus on, on Him. So now, how will you strengthen your brothers and sisters? Maybe you can be the one to share Jesus with that hurting friend. Maybe you can be the one that share your own experiences of how you wrestled with the exact same sin or something similar that, that you can point them to Jesus as the one who can truly fix this. Maybe you can be the one to, to write that letter of encouragement or to stop by and be that friend. Maybe you can be the one to be, be active here at church in some way that, that you can help to, to spread that gospel of Jesus to others. How will you encourage your brothers and sisters now that you too have been sifted as we So fellow kernels, kernels of wheat, having been sifted yourself, rejoice in the truth that Jesus was sifted for you. He is the one that has conquered every temptation for you. So cling to him. Rejoice in the victories that he has already won for you. And then, in the joy of that, serve. Strengthen your brothers and sisters, having been sifted as wheat. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are truly humbled when we consider just the amazing ways that you use even temptation to break us down, to wake us up to our sins, especially our pride, clinging to ourselves. Lord, forgive us for that. And thank you for the work of Jesus, who was sifted himself to be our Savior, to grant us eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. Now, Lord, inspire us through that message of forgiveness. Be lights in this dark world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We gathered our offering as we came in here this evening, so let's continue with, with our prayers. Please stand. Abide with us, Lord, for this evening and the day is almost over. Abide with us and with your whole church. Abide with us in the evening of the day, in the evening of life, in the evening of the world. Abide with us in your grace and goodness, in your holy word and sacrament, in your comfort and blessing. Abide with us when we are overcome by the night of sorrow and fear, by the night of doubt and affliction, by the night of bitter death. Abide with us and with all your people in time and in eternity. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us. closing hymn in 137, you may be seated.